Well, good morning. Happy Easter. He is alive. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand up as we worship God this morning. sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope, no place to be your love made a way, your love made a way to let mercy come in, when death was arrested. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dead. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace, oh, your grace, so free, washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. It's your endless love, it's your
Go ahead. start to warm up. You get, did you do your vocal warm ups? <clears throat> la 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 la. I, I, I. Watermelon. Watermelon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yo. Fee, fi, fo, fum. Okay, I'm good. Okay. You ready? Yep. All right, we're ready. Welcome to Bailey Christian Church. It's Easter Sunday, right? Easter it is Sunday. Easter Sunday. I checked my calendar this morning just to double check, but yeah. we're here. It's good, Easter. good. I'm glad you're here. Did you have an Easter egg hunt this morning? I didn't. I was. Uh, my wife told me I was too old for that. I was looking forward to it this year, but unfortunately, I think I aged out. Good time to start because your daughter could use some help, That's right. Right? That's right? She can she crawl through the yard and find them. Absolutely. And then I keep all the candy. You're catching on. That's the program. Excellent. Well, hey, today's announcements here at Bailey Christian Church, welcome. I'm glad you guys are here. First up, there's an Israel trip. In case you're interested in checking that out, ooh, that could be a good trip. It's in the app. Look for details in there. That's great. If you're new here this morning, thank you for joining us uh, here at Bailey. Grab one of the Connect cards in the seat pocket in front of you. Just let us know you were here. We'd love to connect with you. Um, and uh, yeah, learn more about who you are. Excellent, cool. Hey, you know what? There's a banquet coming up. Have you heard about this banquet? I have heard about the banquet. Is there food at the banquet? I hope so. I like usually desserts at the banquet. Dessert. Start with dessert, right? There's a banquet coming up. This is the big kickoff start for our next phase here at Bailey Christian Church. We want to continue to reach the community through children and the next next generation, right? Yeah, not so. just reach the community, but also create a better space for our own as well. I can hear the toddlers banging on the wall right now. Uh, if you listen, everybody listen. Can you hear them? Yeah, they're probably over there. It's yeah. probably Zimmerman Pretty kid. rambunctious. Right, very good. Well, excellent. Well, guess what? We've got more announcements. What do you have? That's my turn. Is, I, I do turn. have the next announcement. You do right have the my, next one. My notes. The Michigan Christian Convention uh, is happening on April 18th. Um, through the 20th, you can sign up on the app to get more information as well, or head to the website. Hey, I forgot to mention that the banquet is on April 15th. The banquet is on Put April 15th. Put that on your calendar. We should probably Thank tell you. them about the dates. Why isn't it in your notes? It, it is. It's right here. You just didn't read it before. Oh. April 14th at 5 p.m., right? <laughs> Make sure we get that one. Yes. Right. It's yeah. a Sunday. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. Well, hey, thanks again for coming in. Hey, but right now, we're going to go and greet somebody. So don't be afraid. It's not stranger danger. Stan, raise. Greet somebody new and let them know who your name is. Come up with a new handshake. Uh, fill out the Connect card. Don't forget about that. And uh, enjoy the rest of your service. This service. What do we celebrate? Jesus died on the cross. And what did he do in three days? What did he do three days later? He, he came alive. Came alive, yeah. Yeah. And who was in the tomb when Mary got there? Uh, Jesus. No, nope, Jesus John. wasn't there. Who was, who was at the tomb? Uh, Mary. No, well, she was, but who did she see there? Jesus. God. An angel. Yeah. Angel. Yeah. It all started when 
people were yelling and screaming at Jesus because they didn't believe that he was actually the son of God. And so they put a, like a rope kind of around him. And then they put the crown of thorns on him and started mocking him. And later they made him carry the cross up to, up to the hill where the cross was. And then they hung him on it. He took away everybody's sins. He says about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins and Easter Bunny that are super yummy. <laughs> um, and that's it. He was, um, he went in a grave and then at the very end, he rose from the dead. Uh, there was two soldiers guarding um, the place, and I think they fell asleep. And then they, someone took them, or yeah. And then um, he, Jesus, uh, um, Mary went in to see if um, Jesus was still there. Mary um, went to. Um, Go, um, put Jesus' um, ashes in the tomb, and then she noticed that Jesus wasn't there. When pe two people went to put his ashes in the tomb, they saw that he wasn't there, and then um, Jesus wasn't there, and then she saw that his, his body was not there. And there was two angels, and they, they told her that something, and then... And it, there was an angel instead, and then Jesus came up behind them and said, Do not touch me, for you have seen me. And she said, Are you the man who took Jesus' body? And he said, Mary. And she went to him. Most kids think Easter's about finding egg, having eggs, Easter eggs and bunnies, but it's actually spending time together and about Jesus' words. Uh, Easter is about celebrating Jesus. Some people think it's about like um, the Easter bunny and getting like eggs full of candy, but that's not it. Jesus died on the cross for us, so, and he rose from the dead. <laughs> I just wanted you guys to know that uh, this is a quartet. You just can't tell it, right? Uh, no, uh, we, we had our friend Terry Prickett. He was uh, part of our group, but he is not feeling well this morning. So we praying that he gets feeling better. Uh, but we decided to, to trudge on as a trio. So I hope you enjoy this. <coughs> things in a way 
runs to the weary, the worn and the weak, and the same. I invite you to stand with us as we continue in worship. Again, glorious King, Hallelujah. 
thank you that you didn't stay in that grave. Father, we praise you that you have risen and you are, you are alive and well. And Father, and through that resurrection, we have life. And Jesus, we love you for all that you've done for us, for the sacrifice on the cross that we observed on, on Good Friday and, and, and your resurrection today. And Father, we just pray that you would help us to live like somebody who's been redeemed. God, we thank you. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. amen. You may be seated. Darren Penwell, lead pastor here. For those of you that are new with us, we're just so glad uh, to have you, whether you're family or new to the area or just uh, for whatever reason, uh, this is your first Sunday with us. We're just so glad to have you. How many of you were here on Good Friday? Wasn't that awesome? That was, I mean, uh, for those of you that uh, were not here, it was an opportunity for the area churches and pastors um, to celebrate as one community. The place was packed and there were people upstairs as well uh, in the overflow. Um, and what a neat testimony to the, to the community. And so um, if you haven't been to one of those, I want to encourage you now, look to next year. I don't know when Easter is next year. I know it's somewhere around this time. Uh, it switches, but um, that Good Friday, you'd be a part of that just as a chance to, to celebrate as a community of believers, to realize that we're, um, we're in this thing uh, together. Well, this is, this is in what we call uh, in, in ministry the big dance. I mean, this is the big game. This is the, uh, the day that we, we get a chance to sometimes speak to, to folks we never get a chance to, to speak to at other times in the year. And so if that happens to be you, we're just so glad that, that you're here. We, we love to have uh, new faces and families and friends because more importantly, we, we, uh, we want people um, on their journey uh, to come to find Christ. Um, 
And so that's our heart and our desire this morning. I want to uh, take a, a moment just to pray for us, and then we're going to get into our, our, our study this morning. Jesus, we, um, we love you. Um, and maybe some of us are even here today, and not, they're not sure just yet about that, and, 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 and that's okay too. I just pray for wherever uh, each person is in their journey, whether they are walking closely with you or whether they're just considering this. They're, they're seeking, but they're not sure. I pray that... That, that all of our eyes and hearts and minds and our ears would be opened um, to see you, not just as a person, not just as a, as a prophet or a great teacher, but as the, the, the Savior uh, of the world, the one who, who died and rose again, the God of all creation come in human form. Uh, we pray that you'd be lifted up in this time this morning. We pray in, in your name, Jesus. Amen. British scholar N.T. Wright poses this question. He says, when was the last time that you said, if only? If, if only. If only she had worked harder and not failed her exam. If only he hadn't stepped out in front of that car. If, if only we had different leadership. If only we hadn't decided to go out that night. A lot of our lives are lived with that perspective. In fact, that's why I think it's such a strong theme in so many movies. I remember uh, back in the, in the 80s, the, the, the very first Back to the Future came out with Doc Brown and Marty McFly and the flux capacitor, the whole, the whole thing. And the idea of going back in, in time, changing something and so that it will forever be different. Well, in, in our passage this morning, and if only shows up, and it's tied to Jesus, if only Jesus had been there. If Jesus, if you, if you had only shown up on time. You see, Jesus had gotten word in John chapter 11 that his good friend Lazarus was on his deathbed. But rather than go to him immediately, Jesus waits. He waits days. And in the meantime, his friend Lazarus dies. But Jesus has intentions. He has plans for this. So let's pick up the story. John chapter 11, beginning in verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to, to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Now, Martha and Mary and Lazarus were good friends of Jesus. She, this is not the first time he's been to their house. We have other stories in Scripture where he shows up there, and Martha's busy in the kitchen, and, and Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet, and Martha wants... Jesus to reprimand her and tell Mary to get back in the kitchen and help out, and Jesus says, no, she's chosen, chosen well. So Jesus is not unfamiliar with this territory. In fact, probably a place at times when he is in the Jerusalem area, he would say, because it's only two miles from Jerusalem. But when Jesus shows up, Lazarus has been dead for four days. Here's why that's significant. It is said that in, in the early centuries of the, of, the, of, of the first centuries, that there were many Jews who held to this belief that the, the soul of a person would kind of linger around that person for three days. But after four days, once composition, decomposition had set in, that they were really, really ultimately dead. Now, they, they, they understood what death was, and they understood uh, what, it, what it meant for uh, for somebody to be put in the tomb, but there was this kind of old wives' tale that held to this. So what John is basically showing us is that Lazarus is really dead. He's really dead. There's, there's, no, there's no getting around it at this point. And his death, and you have to understand in the, the early um, Jewish culture, in fact, probably even true today, but especially back then, it was a very public mourning. It was known as Sheba. And for seven days, the family and the friends and the community would mourn the loss of, of a loved one. It would begin the day of the burial, and the day of the burial happened the day of the person's death. 
But it was such a public thing that people would come from other parts of it, probably people from Jerusalem who had gotten word of this. They would even pay people who to play flutes and to mourn with them. It was a very public type of thing. And so by the time Jesus shows up, this is, they're already well into their Shiva. And look at verse 21. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if only. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. See, Martha runs out to give Jesus a piece of her mind. She's ticked. I mean, she's hurt. She's hurt. She'd sent word, how come you didn't come when I asked you to come? But I want to point out too, while it sounds like Martha's saying, but even now, I don't believe that Martha had a clue of what Jesus was about to do. Even though she expresses faith in him, And we can see that by what she says next. Take a look at verse 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Well, as you can see in a moment, that's not really a lot of comfort to Martha because she says, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. You see, Martha and many of the Jewish people in that time held to the idea that the righteous dead would be resurrected at the end of time on the last day and they they would live to be with, they'd be raised and live with God. But Jesus has something else in mind. Take a look at verse 25. And here's our verse, our key verse this morning. Jesus said to her, I I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who is to come into the world. This is a really powerful statement. Martha expresses the the heart of John's gospel. The heart of John's book is that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Son of God. She's starting to kind of wrap her brain around that. However, she still doesn't fully know what this means yet. She doesn't know the implications of, of this yet. And so in Jesus' conversation with Martha, he's pushing her to see what she and the others just can't wrap their brains around. It doesn't even occur to them. And here's the point. If Jesus is the resurrection and the life, then something amazing in all of history is just broken in. And if you have faith in the one who has life, then life has come to you too. But here in the story, there's what we call in, in uh, seminary a pregnant pause. That means there's a pause here with lots to come, with lots of, of possibilities. And so he kind of kind of pauses here because Martha goes back home, tells Mary that she's been with Jesus and that Jesus is asking for her. And so Mary comes out and has kind of the same conversation. If only you had been here. And then Jesus is is watching and seeing people grieving and mourning in its ear. In verse 35, that is the shortest verse of the Bible, says Jesus wept. Watching all of this, he weeps. Well, We'll come back to that part of the story here in just a little bit. But before we do, I want us to to get a chance to look at what we can learn from Martha and how she approaches this and realize that she approaches it the way a lot of us approach life. And and if you're looking on your insert and want to follow along uh, or on your app, I want to invite you to take a look here. And and the first thing is this, that many of us go through life staring at the rearview mirror. We're looking back hoping and wishing we could change the past and its implications for today, just like Martha, if only. When I was in seminary in Lincoln, Illinois, uh, for two or three summers, I, I mowed the, the, the college lawn. It was, it was huge. And uh, uh, some of you know this about me and uh, my OCD. I, if you're going to mow a lawn, you've got to mow it straight. And so it's really important. But here's what I would do at times. I would mow, and then I would look back, because you can't tell if you're mowing a straight line. Looking for, I mean, you can look at the tree or whatever's in front of you, but you don't know if you're running a straight You have to look back to know if you're, if you're going straight, but here's what would happen. I'd have a little squiggle, and then I would try to correct. And here's the problem with looking back and trying to mow forward. That little squiggle eventually becomes a much bigger squiggle, and you realize that you can't mow a straight line looking back. You can only move forward and, 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 and get back on track. 
And so Jesus is going to call Martha to, to look ahead here in just a little bit. But here's part of the problem. When many of us look back in our rearview mirror, looking backward to try to straighten things up, there are a couple of things that can happen. One is we end up focusing on our mistakes. I mean, some of us, let's just be honest, some of us here today, and maybe unbeknownst to those around you, are things about our past that we're just so ashamed of. Things that we think that may disqualify us from God ever loving us, ever accepting us. Things that we may stay awake at night fretting over and going through our minds, if only I could go back and undo them. On the other hand, there are some that look back and may actually focus on past successes, romanticizing the past. Um, I remember in high school when the Jostin ring dealer would come. It was like freshman, sophomore year. They'd show a little video. He was like a, a hype man. And he would tell you this, high schoolers, these are the best days of your life. You know, at first I'm like, yeah. And then you, and you start thinking, hey, man, I'm like... I'm 15. Uh, I'm 16 at the moment. That doesn't say a lot about my future. <laughs> These are the best days of my life. I, it's all downhill from here. And some of us actually live that way. The, the, the best things are, are, are in our, our past. And so we, we try to reclaim those glory days. If only we could pull that back into today, like that guy who's 30-something who's still hanging around the local high school wearing his letterman jacket, hoping to get the glory he once had. Let's go back to your insert because this is where I want to draw your attention. Whether your, your focus is on past mistakes or your, your focus is tied to your past successes, I want you to understand, number one, the negative parts of your past don't define you. Some of you need to hear that. You go, it's so big, it does define me. No. Uh, Paul puts it this way in Philippians chapter 3. And I want you to understand, when I, before I read this, who Paul is and his story. Paul at one point will say, I'm the worst of all sinners. And so why does he say that? Because he persecuted the church of Christ. He helped put people to death who were following Jesus. And so Paul's message is, if, if Jesus can save me, there's hope for you. And here's what he puts in verse 13 through 14, he said, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He said, I haven't reached it yet, but I know what I can't do. I can't live driving forward by looking in the rearview mirror. And here's the next thing. If your focus is on your successes, the best parts of your past are not as good as the things to come. Ecclesiastes, I love the writer of Ecclesiastes in chapter 7, verse 10. He says, do not say, why were the old days better than these? You've been there, haven't you? Man, where did we get off the track? Right? Things were so much better back then. He says, for it is not wise to ask such questions. And so in Martha, we see somebody who's looking, if only, and we, we recognize ourselves in that. We, we can tend to do that, if only. But the story continues. Because Mary now runs out. <clears throat> and she encounters Jesus, and Jesus now approaches the tomb of Lazarus, having he's weeping in the midst of this. And he eventually comes to the tomb, and in a loud voice, he calls, Lazarus, come forth. With grave clothes clinging to him, Lazarus emerges alive. And what Jesus is saying, he's putting an exclamation point on the end of his statement, I am the resurrection and life. He who believes in me, even though they die, shall live. And he's saying that resurrection and life has broken in. And so let's go back to our insert. Jesus Jesus' call is this. Jesus' call is to go through life looking to the future. To go through life looking ahead. Jesus calls Martha to look to the resurrection. Now, as I said earlier, the, the Jewish people, many of them in, in Jesus' day, believed that there would eventually be a resurrection at the end of time. But not now. 
not in this, in this moment. Yet Jesus was saying, more than just look to the future, what he's saying is, look right in front of you. The resurrection and the life is here now in your midst. N.T. Wright puts it this way. I, I, I love it. He says, the future has burst into the present. The new creation and with it the resurrection has come forward from the end of time into the middle of time. And he goes on to say, resurrection then isn't just a doctrine, it isn't just a future fact, it's a person, and here he is standing in front of Martha, teasing her to make a huge jump of faith and hope. Resurrection has come, life has come. So let me interject a question. I think it's an important question for us all to wrestle with. What difference does it make that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Some of you may be familiar with the Babylon Bee, um, kind of fun, fake news. Well, the, the precursor to the Babylon Bee was the onion. And back uh, several years ago, they ran a, a humorous article. And the article was titled, World Death Rate Holding Steady at 100%. And the, the, the article goes on to say, World Health Organization officials expressed disappointment Monday at the, at the group's finding that despite the enormous efforts of doctors, rescue workers, and other medical professionals worldwide, the global death rate remains constant at 100%. Death, and he goes, they go on to define, a metabolic affliction causing total shutdown of all life functions has long been considered humanity's number one health concern. <laughs> Responsible for 100% of all recorded fatalities worldwide, the condition has no cure. I'm quoting, one of the, quoting the, the WHO director, I was really hoping what with all of these new radiology treatments, rescue helicopters, aer aerobics TV shows, so this dates it a little bit, and what, what have you, that we might at least make a dent in, in death this year. Unfortunately, it would appear that the death rate remains constant and total as it has inviolably since the dawn of time. But people still fight it. In fact, uh, in 2000, 2000, the Chicago Tribune ran an article about a, a, a city in France, the, the, the town of Les Lavandeaux on the French Riviera. They passed a law, barring any more burials in the town cemetery. It was full. And so here's what the law read. It is forbidden without a cemetery plot to die on the territory of the commune. Now, sadly, the law hasn't stopped people from dying because up, up to that point in writing, 19 people were still well, they weren't, they weren't holding, but their families were holding for them to find a spot to be able to bury them. They were being buried with friends until they could find a plot. But in Jesus, the cure to life's ultimate problem has come. Some may wonder, what, so what's the big deal about the death and the resurrection? Guys, this, this is it. I mean, you, we're longing for hope. I mean, people with, with all sorts of money and technology are trying to come to, a, to a, an answer to this, but Jesus has already brought the cure. But while there is currently no cure for physical death, life and hope have already come. So go back to your insert, because this is what Jesus is trying to draw out. It means that life begins now, and resurrection breaks into the present you see, I think a lot of us, even uh, now uh, as Christians, you know, 2,000 years out, I think we have a similar view to Martha and some of the Jewish people. That eternal life waits for us when we die or when Jesus returns. And that's not true. Jesus is saying, if you know me, eternal life has broken in. Early in his career, the, the great American playwright Eugene O'Neill wrote an imaginative play about Lazarus, and the title of the play was Lazarus Laughed. It's about Lazarus' life after Jesus raised him from the dead. And near the beginning of the play, guests from Bethany, well, where he's from, are gathering for a banquet in Lazarus' honor. And they're all desperate to hear what Lazarus has to say about his experience. Can you imagine that? As they take their seats, one guest says, the whole look of his face has changed. 
He's like a stranger from a far land. There, there's no longer any sorrow in his eyes. They, they must have forgotten sorrow in the grave. Another guest, one who had helped roll the tombstone aside, recalls the, the scene after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in even more beautiful terms. And he says, and then Lazarus knelt and kissed Jesus' feet, and both of them smiled, and Jesus blessed him, and he called him my brother. And he went away. And Lazarus, looking after him, began to laugh softly like a man in love with God. Such a laugh I have never heard. It made my ears drunk. I w- it was like wine, and though I was half dead with fright, I found myself laughing too. What a beautiful picture. Imagine what it must have been like to be Lazarus. I, I, I don't want this, what are the stories? What was it like? Everyone must have wanted to see and hear him and, 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 and hear the story. In fact, the religious leaders in Jerusalem, because Jesus did this, wanted to kill him too. Because there was nothing they could say about it. They knew he was dead. He was four days gone, and Jesus raised him from the tomb. They were more concerned about their position. They wanted him dead. But more to the point, I want you to think of this. Have you ever heard somebody telling their story of finding Jesus? And the way to this, they describe it is like somebody coming from death to life, from darkness into the light, who's been healed. My eyes have been opened. You see, what Jesus does here is he shows that resurrection and life have broken in to time. And they do not wait solely for the end. They start now. Now, yes, physically we will still die unless Jesus returns. And sadly, here's here's the downside for Lazarus, he had to die again. But in eternity, life is promised. But it actually begins now spiritually. In fact, take a look at, at your insert again. However resurrection has broken in, it also means that the full experience of the resurrection still awaits. The best is yet to come. The writer Peggy Noonan said, Our ancestors believed in two worlds. And they understood to this life here on earth to be the solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short one of the two. And then the writer goes on to say, We are the first generation of man that actually expected to find happiness on this earth. You see, Jesus' message is the best is yet to come. So take a look back at your insert. Finally, this. Here's what the resurrection means. Jesus' resurrection is so important because, first of all, it proves that what he said is true. That his claims about who he, who he is and what could happen through him, they're true. Secondly, it proves that he and he alone can bring life. And nobody else has done this. He alone can bring life because of his own resurrection. And it proves that if you know him, you have life now. Not just in eternity, not just down the road. You have life now. And it carries over into eternity. Rick Warren, former pastor of Saddleback Church, writer of The Purpose Driven Life. Some of you have read that. Now, you may have heard back a few years ago, he and his wife Kay lost their, their son, Matthew. His battle with depression and, um, and, and mental health issues, um, he died by suicide. And about a year after this tragedy, Rick said, I've often been asked, how, how have you made it through this? How have you kept going in your pain? And I've often replied, the answer is Easter. You see, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus happened over three days. Friday was the day of suffering and pain and agony. Saturday was the day of doubt and confusion and misery. But Easter, that Sunday, was a day of hope and joy and victory. And here's the fact of life. And this is true for us too. It says you will face these three days over and over in your lifetime. And when you do, you'll find yourself asking, as I did, three fundamental questions. Number one, what do I do in my days of pain? Number two, how do I get through my days of doubt and confusion? 
And number three, how do I get to the days of joy and victory? And he concludes, the answer is Easter. The answer is Easter. The answer is the resurrection. That Jesus puts a fine point that all of a sudden life has come. And so let me just pause here because each of us are in different places in our life. But I want to highlight a, a, couple, of, a, a couple of characters in the story again. I'm going to go back to Martha. I think what we learn in the story is that if you're Martha, hurting and confused, she was hurt and confused, run to Jesus and tell him how you feel because he longs to hear even your hurts. Some of you are hurting. And you've loved Jesus for a long time, but he doesn't make sense to you at times. He didn't show up, and you have been running through your mind, if only Jesus, you had shown up. He's big enough to hear that, so tell him. But maybe you're more like Lazarus, and you are currently dead in your sins. Let this be your word today, to cry out to Jesus, who alone can give you the resurrection and the life. Because here's what, as N.T. Wright comes back to the, to, to the point when he moves from if only, he says this, what Jesus is doing is he's challenging Martha and by extension us to turn our if only to if Jesus. That is, if Jesus is who she is coming to believe he is, if Jesus is the Messiah, the one who is praised by the prophets, the, the one who has come into the world, he is God's own son, the one in whom the living God is strangely and newly present. If he is resurrection in person, life come to life, then what does that mean for you and me? I'll tell you what it means. It means hope has come. It means that no matter what this world throws at us, it will not be the end of the story. That the best is yet to come, that the best is not in the past, and the worst will not define us. Because if we're in Christ, life has come. Resurrection has broken in. And the future has come into the present. Bob Russell, who will be at the Michigan Christian Convention, is preaching about Easter, and he says, I, I loved our Easter pageant. One night I sat behind a five-year-old boy who was enthralled watching the story of Jesus, and when the crucifixion scene took place, he got real quiet. But when Jesus came back from the grave and there was a song of celebration and his eyes lit up, he looked at his mother and he said, he's alive, Mom. He's alive. And he began to clap, and he, and he hugged her around the neck. It was fun to see somebody understand the resurrection for the first time. Well, Russell goes on to say, I, I told that to a youth minister from, from another church, and he said, I want to tell you what happened in our church. We, we showed a cartoon video of the crucifixion and resurrection to our kindergarten students. And when Jesus was buried, one little boy who knew the story pretty well turned to a buddy and said, He's dead now, but he'll be back. Folks, that's the, that is the message of Easter, that resurrection and life has broken into the present. And so what appeared on that Friday as the ultimate loss was turned for good and for hope and for beauty three days later. That's why we call what happened Friday Good Friday. We don't call it good because in the midst of it, there, there's nothing good about it. It only makes sense three days later. It only makes sense through the lens of the empty tomb. And such is true when we come to communion. I want you to imagine it's Thursday. Friday is looming, and Jesus knows that. And he takes one last opportunity, one last meal to drive home what this is all about. They're not going to get it. They don't fully understand it. They will afterwards. And so in the midst of this special meal, which was the Jewish Passover, the commemoration of God's deliverance of his people out of bondage in Egypt, Jesus will bring the elements of this meal together and he will say, this is me. 
this is me. In Luke 22, verse 19, Luke describes it this way, and he took the bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Can't imagine that on Friday, all of that was lost to them. But then just think on Easter and the days that, that followed, they're looking back and going, oh, that's what he meant. That's what that was all about. Well, we, we've seen the story. We've watched the movie. We know how it ends. And that's why we can take communion on, on every Sunday or whenever we take it. And we can remember Good Friday, and we can call it good, and we, and we can be maybe midway on Saturday, and we know that's not the end, and then we can come to the empty tomb and we can celebrate. And we know that this isn't even the end of the story. The best still awaits. And so this morning as we come to communion, we celebrate both what Jesus did on the cross, but we celebrate it because we know what happens three days later. And so this morning, I, I want to invite you, if you're a Christian, you don't have to be a member here, but if you're a Christian, you're welcome to partake with us in, in communion here in just a moment. The trays will be passed, and you can go ahead and take those two cups, and, and you just spend some time with the resurrection and the life. But if you're uh, new with us here today, and you're still, you haven't, you're not sure yet, you haven't stepped across that line, um, the, I just invite you to, to, to reflect and, and maybe use this as an opportunity just to pray and say, God, if you're really there, then, then make it clear to me. I, I'm not there yet, but I, I want to be there. And so would you move my heart and my understanding and open my eyes? If you're really there, I, I, I want you. And here's what the Bible says, that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In other words, that if there's a longing and a seeking, he says, if you knock, the door will be opened. If you seek, you will find. If you, if you ask, it will be given to you. And so I'm just going to invite you, if you're not there yet, that you at least to, to, to tell God where you're at. And I'd love to talk with you afterwards in the guest connection area. But as we come to, to communion, let's remember, we come to the one who is the resurrection and the life. And it doesn't wait for our funeral day. It starts now. Let's pray. Jesus, we come to you and we give you the praise. All the glory that goes to you. And we want you to know that the reason we gather is not just because it's a kind of a special family thing that, that, that we do uh, yearly or, or because they have to check a spiritual or religious box. It's because this is the story that defines us. This is the story that breaks into the middle of all of history and says there's hope. So God come down in human form to bear our sins and to conquer death. And so we just say thank you ask your blessing on this time, but we really will encounter you in this moment, that we will walk away changed, that this Easter will not just be a neat story and something we, we see in our rearview mirror, but it will be something that we live in the present, something that we long and look forward to in the future. And so as we take this meal, we remember not only that we're taking it now, but we will one day take it in your presence and celebrate. And so for that day, we, we long. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
uh, as we come to offering, <coughs> this, <coughs> excuse me, as we come to offering this morning, um, I was just thinking about the, you know, the classic Tony Campolo, you know, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming, you know, but I look at Sunday came, Sunday's there, the resurrection has happened, and um, as we give this morning, um, may we give remembering um, all that uh, Christ gave for us, so let's pray for the offering. Heavenly Father, we are just um, honored to be in your presence. Um, we are just grateful um, for um, the hope of today um, and that we can carry that hope throughout the year. Um, and may we remember that, God, in what we give to you um, of our um, belongings, of our time, um, of our love to you, God. And may we just um, honor you today and bless this offering and may it bring honor to you. Amen. Go ahead and stand with us as we close out this awesome service.
Uh, my name is Zach. I'm the youth minister here uh, at Bailey. If you have any questions about anything or need prayer for any reason, head over to our guest connection after the service. Darren will be in there with a member um, of our prayer team. Before I close, um, I wanted to read a section out of Romans chapter 8. The Apostle Paul um, writes this in Romans. He says, Now if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his Spirit who lives in you. This week, let's live like that, church. He is risen. Uh, he is risen indeed. Let's pray as we close our service this morning. Heavenly Father, we praise you uh, this morning. You are the giver of good gifts. You restore um, our soul. And so, Father, we just pray for a blessing this week that we live out of that boldness. Um, we live uh, in obedience to you, Lord. And I just pray if there's anybody in here wrestling, uh, that your spirit just moves uh, and that uh, decisions are made this morning. Lord, we lift you high uh, with our shouts of praise and, and uh, we just thank you for this community, this body um, uh, where we can just worship um, and we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.